So in this video, I'm going to dive deeper into the details of how bootstrapping actually works. And I'm going to do that starting with the, the first case of a non-parametric bootstrap. And so remember, that's the one that's based on the idea of drawing uh, samples from the data from the original data. So the idea being you need to draw replicate data sets by resampling the original data. And what I'm going to lay out here is, is an algorithm, and it's an important algorithm to remember. You know, this is the sort of stuff that, that is actually worth kind of understanding the steps and really spending time uh, making sure you understand what's going on here. So first step, draw a replicate sample of the data by resampling the original data. Next, we fit our parameters to that resample. So we, we use whatever method we fit, use to fit our model, such as maximum likelihood to get an estimate of the best fit parameters from that sample of data. And we then repeat this procedure n times. Draw a replicate, fit the parameters, get an S, you know, save the estimate of the parameters. Draw a replicate data set, fit our model, get an estimate of parameters. Draw a replicate data set, fit our parameters, get an estimate of parameters. And, um, and we are, every iteration through this, we're saving our estimated parameters. And then once we have you know, these n samples of the estimate of the parameters, we can use those estimated parameter samples to estimate our Compton interval based on the sample quantiles, to estimate standard error based on the sample standard deviation, things like that. So how does this work? And specifically, what do we mean by resampling? So here's a simple example of resampling. So imagine my original data was just the numbers one through 10. Um, and if I, let's say I'm interested in fitting just a sam simple sample mean to that original data set. And so the original mean was five and a half. Now let's say I asked a computer to randomly resample this data set. And importantly, we're, resamp we're doing what's called resampling with replacement. So imagine like if you ever, if you played bingo, you had a bingo ball, a bingo uh, cage and it has 10 balls in it with the numbers one through 10 in it. And uh, in this case, every time a number comes out, we write it down and we put it back in. If we didn't do that, like putting it back in, then all we would get back is the original data set just in a different order. And the original data set just in a different order is gonna have the same mean. It's not going to change any of the summary statistics. Uh, you know, the order of the data doesn't matter. Now here, though, since we're sampling it with replacement, we're able to get some numbers repeated and some numbers dropped. So if we look at this sample, you can see the number five is in the first slot, but it's also in the third. It's repeated. And so since that's repeated, it means something else, like six, isn't in this data set at all. And then we look at the next sample. In the next sample, I have two nines and I have two tens, but I have no ones and I have no sevens or eights. Um, and so, you know, so we can repeat it and repeat it. And we do this n times, this process of taking a draw from the original data uh, just randomly. Uh, and then each time we do this, we can calculate a summary statistic. And so in this first sample, the mean was 5.4 instead of 5.5. Next one, it was 6.3 because I got these two dines and two tens. But you know, that shouldn't happen very often. So maybe 16.3 isn't you know a good bit above average. And then a 5.6, that's just a little bit above average. Um, and so if we keep doing this, we get a whole lot of samples, and then we can actually see by making a histogram, how often we see different results. And so the mean of all these samples is you know, at the, the sample mean of the original, 5.5. But we can see that you know, because we only have 10 numbers, every once in a while, I get a mean uh, that's really low or a mean that's really high. And theoretically, I could get a mean of one if I just by chance you know, sample the number one 10 times. Uh, but the odds of that are pretty low. And likewise, the maximum is going to be 10. I could sample all, you know, the number 10, 10 times, but the odds of that are pretty low. But in all, we see a distribution and we can use that distribution to calculate statistics such as 
the standard error here is 0.9. Um, and the confidence interval goes from you know, 3.7 to 7.3. And so that's done by literally saying, if I take, again, if, like if I take a thousand samples, uh, the inner 95% would represent 950 and the outer would represent 25 and 25. If I take 10,000 samples, I would have 250 on one side, 250 on the other side, um, and 9,500 in the middle. Uh, but in, and you could do this for any interval you were interested in. If you want a 95 or 90 or 80 or 99, um, you know whatever interval you want, you can do. And in fact, one other really important thing to note uh, about using bootstrapping to estimate interval estimates is the 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 bigger the interval estimate you need for any particular application, the more samples you need. So if I wanted to in estimate uh, the mean, I can get a good estimate of the mean with a very num small number of samples. If I want a good estimate of, say, the inner quartile range, you know, 25% to 75%, I need more samples, but not a lot. But if I want 95%, I need even more samples. If I want 99%, I need even more. So like, if you think about it, if I took 100 samples, my 99% confidence interval is based on the single most extreme random number I drew. And if a 95% is based on the five most extreme numbers I drew, uh, and, and so those estimates aren't going to be very sta stable with only 100 samples, you know, but with thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of samples, these estimates at higher quantiles become more and more stable. Cool. So a few other things to know about this resampling. So this just represents... Um, the idea of where I just have one vector of data, but very often I don't just have a vector of data. I often have, say, a, a set of Ys I'm trying to predict using a set of Xs, and that might be a, you know a Russian model, or it might be a nonlinear model where we again have some X Y relationship. So it's important if we are uh, trying to understand the uncertainty in our parameters and trying to draw confidence intervals or trying to test hypotheses it's really, really important that we resample all of our covariates simultaneously. So that if I select, you know, that, that every Y is paired with a set of Xs. And when I do this resampling, I don't resample the Ys and then resample the Xs because if I resample the Ys and resample the Xs, then I have no relationship between the Xs and the Ys. I'm always sampling them as a unit. Uh, and another way of thinking that is, Another way of thinking about that is I am sampling the rows of data in my data table. And that, that is preserving the covariance structure between my different data sets. And importantly, the relationships between my X's and Y's are preserved. Uh, so I'm preserving, again, I'm preserving the relationship between my X's and Y's, and I'm also preserving any covariances between my X's. And a, the easiest way to sample rows is to actually sample the row numbers. And so this original data set one through 10 might not actually represent the numbers one through 10, but it might actually represent row one through row 10 in a data set that has multiple columns. And that therefore I can just resample everything jointly. By contrast, if I actually wanted to know uh, whether the parameters I am getting are different than some null value, I would want to actually do a resampling that generates a null distribution. So if I wanted to, do, to fit a null model, I might you know, resample my x's and y's independently uh, and then ask the question, if I resample my x's and y's independently and fit the model where there, when there is no relationship, is the value that I observed you know, different from that? And so if I wanted to do a kind of a bootstrapped p-value, I might do this kind of uh, null model resampling. Uh, that said, for a lot of the rest of the class, we're going to focus on this kind of normal version where we are resampling rows and trying to understand the uncertainties and the parameters themselves. Because it's also, you know, that, that, that can be helpful by itself to understand, uh, you know, how, you know, what portion of the tails is the actual null value occurring. The other thing that's worth noting is that uh, resampling data 
uh, independently can be difficult when you have highly structured data. So this is one of the challenges with bootstrapping is if I have uh, some sort of complex sampling screen where I have, you know, sites and then plots within sites and then individuals with plots and, you know, this whole hierarchical structure and I have multiple variables, it can be challenging to kind of resample things in a way that ref reflects that structure. Um, okay, so the last bit here on this slide is to, is to say, well, how do you actually do this? Um, so in R, there's a really handy function called sample. And sample takes uh, a number of arguments. The first is the thing that you want resampled. Uh, the second is the number of samples you want to take. And the third is whether you want to sample with replacement or not. And so by default, you know, if X is the thing I want to resample, the number of samples I want to take is always the length of X. I want to say, reiterate that. It's really, really important that if you're doing bootstrapping, the number of samples you take is the same as the number of data points you have. Um, because what you're trying to understand is your uncertainty in your parameters for samples that are equivalent to the ones you have. You know, if you resample and, and magically pretend you had two, three, four, five, ten, 10, 100 times as much data than you actually do, you're going to get really narrow estimates of your parameters, much narrower than what you actually have. Um, later in the semester, I'll come back to that because that, that idea is actually very handy for calculating things like power. So how much data would I need uh, to, to detect something uh, and, and to estimate uh, how much, if I need to do more field sampling, how much more data do I need in order to get, uh, to constrain the parameters of my model. But for right now, let's focus on estimating the uncertainty in the parameters by themselves. And so in that case, you always want to resample the same size. Okay, so let's take this and now put it together uh, with our maximum likelihood algorithm to think about how we would do this. So this set of code here, and we're going to unpack this line by line, uh, is an example of fitting a quadratic model by maximum likelihood. Now we've already talked about the fact that we can fit a quadratic using LM because it's a polynomial and we know how to do that. But imagine for a second uh, that I, I didn't know that and I thought L quadratic was a nonlinear model and I, and I wanted to write down the maximum likelihood estimate for it. So this first chunk here of code is just that maximum likelihood. So I'm writing down my uh, negative log likelihood function as a function of my parameters and my input data, x and y. I'm calculating the log likelihood. So I have my normal likelihood given my observed data y, the predictions from my quadratic model here, uh, my standard deviation, log equals true, sum up over all those log likelihoods, and change the sign to negative in order to get uh, the negative log likelihood to minimize that. Um, I'm going to start with an initial guess uh, for what I think these parameters could be, and then I'm going to pass those to optum. So here I'm passing my initial guess, my log likelihood function, my and my true actual observed data, x and y. And so this out MLE represents my best fit estimate of the parameters. And then again, that's only one set, but it is a set of four parameters simultaneously. Next, this bootstrap code. Uh, first, before we do the bootstrapping, we're just going to set up some variables. So this first thing I'm doing here, and boot, I'm just defining how many bootstrap samples do I actually want to take. And I'm doing it as a variable because I want the ability to you know, change it in one place and have it trickle through the rest of everything else I'm doing. So let's say I'm taking 2,000. Uh, I would say for most applications, um, I recommend about 5,000 samples as a good default. In many cases, you can get away with smaller numbers of samples if you are interested in more central variables. But for assuming we want 95% confidence intervals, I usually go with about five, one to 5,000, 5,000 if you can do it. Uh, next, I'm going, what I'm going, remember what I'm going to be doing is fitting the model a bunch of times. And then I need something to store what comes out of that. So I need something to store the parameters. So I'm making a matrix to store these parameters. I'm going to set that matrix, initialize it to NAs. Uh, 
just because I don't want anything in there. And this way I can you know, be sure that anything that was an NA is something that didn't run. Uh, I'm gonna set the number of rows in this matrix equal to the number of samples I'm gonna take. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this 2000 times. I'm gonna set the columns, the number of parameters I got. So when I go through this loop of doing the bootstrap, every time I go through, I'm gonna get an estimate of four parameters and so I'm gonna fill in one row. And so every row of data here in this table, B boot is gonna represent one iteration of the bootstrap. And every column is gonna be one parameter. And actually one thing that's neat is because uh, every parameter is a column, every sample is a row, I can actually understand the covariances between my parameters just by calculating it using cove. We'll get to that later. Okay, so we've set up the storage and next we're gonna do, we're gonna set up a loop because again, the whole point of how bootstrapping works is, is very loop-like. You, you, know, you generate samples, you fit the model, you save the results and you just do this in a loop um, and we're gonna set up a counter I. It's gonna go from one to the number of bootstrap samples. Our, and then our actual bootstrap is within this squiggly brace. Remember that kind of input output flow diagram. What goes in is a sample of the data. So here I'm gonna use the sample function. Uh, because I have an X, Y relationship, I'm gonna sample the row numbers. And so one through the length of Y are the row numbers. Uh, I wanna take length of Y samples with replacement. This is a pretty general bit of code here, nothing specific to the model we're fitting. Um, I'm gonna then use Optum to fit my model of that data. So I can reuse that same initial condition. I can reuse that same likelihood function. But now instead of passing the X and the Y in, I'm gonna pass X SAMP. So I'm gonna pass it, uh, you know, so if, remember if I just do like X1, it'll give me the first thing in X. If I give it X2, it'll give me the second thing in X. But here, if I give it, uh, you know, all the row numbers, it'll give me back <clears throat> all those X's in the order that I sampled them, which includes any duplicates or any missing values. And I'm gonna pass Y the exact same set of samples. So the resampling between the X and Y are, are staying paired, but the sample that goes into Optum is gonna be different than my original data set. So what comes out, my best fit is gonna be different from my out MLE. Maybe by a little bit, maybe by a lot, it depends how much variability there is in the data. And the next thing I'm gonna do is gonna save the parameters. So remember within what comes out of Optum, the, the, the par part of that is the parameter estimate. And that's what I wanna save. I would say an even more robust version of this code would also check to put in a little error check to, to ask, did this converge before it saves the parameters? Because remember that there's that convergence variable, uh, that status variable in, in the output of Optum so I'm storing that in the, in the ith row of this table. Cool. And the key part here um, is, again, this, this representation of resampling. And that's something that is going to be uh, important because and you can kind of see the rest of this is pretty generic. Uh, it could apply to any problem. But the key part and the key difference between the parametric and the non-parametric is how we generate that sample of data. So if this was my original data set and this was my maximum likelihood best fit parameter, I can go through and do this resampling. And so, you know, sometimes any individual pair, pair of points, any individual point which represents a pair of X, Y values, some of them will be dropped. Some of them will be counted more than once. Uh, and I'll be refitting the same quadratic time and time again. And what comes out is going to be these histograms. And so, here I have a histogram of my intercept. And so my intercept, and I actually can go back and look at it. My intercept is actually pretty close to zero, but uh, what we're seeing is that on average, my, so my maximum likelihood estimate was about minus four, uh, but our distribution is, is pretty broad. And if you were to calculate the quantiles of this distribution, you'd be pretty confident, at least you'd be, I'd be pretty surprised if it's different from zero. Another thing that's kind of neat to note about the bootstrap, uh, and this is actually one of the things that makes it very general and very flexible, uh, 
is in this case, our, our parameter distribution is not actually symmetric. It's, it's got a bit of a skew. And there's actually nothing wrong with that. It's totally acceptable for distributions uh, out of these algorithms to not be symmetric and not to be Gaussian. They just, they're the distribution that they are. Um, and they don't have to have a name. And that's kind of, again, one of the, the, the amazing things in all of this is that we can generate samples of this parameter distribution, even though we never wrote down an equation that represents it. And even though that is not necessarily Gaussian, uh, we get an estimate of our slope. Our slope's positive, which makes sense because uh, it went up. Um, and then our, our beta three, our, our term controlling uh, the curvature, uh, this is, is negative, which is making this a concave down quadratic. Uh, and, and both of these parameters are clearly significantly different from zero because there's no, none of our samples fell on the other side of zero from our mean. And then we also get an estimate of our, our sigma, our standard deviation. So we have you know, an estimate of how much confidence, uh, how much scatter we have around that error. Again, remember the, the sigma is also kind of the estimate of our root mean squared error. Cool, so that in a nutshell is how the, the non-parametric bootstrap works. In the next video, we're gonna go over its, its pair, the parametric bootstrap, and that one will be a bit quicker because we'll be leveraging the ideas from this video.